Hello and welcome to Understanding and Awareness. My name's Lucy and I'm a peer mentor for The Far Away. We are an autistic designed and led company who support autistic adults in and around North East Lincolnshire. We're currently providing support to people who are awaiting a diagnostic assessment for autism. And this video, which is a recorded version of our pre-diagnostic group called Information and Skills While You Wait, is one way of reaching people who may be unable to come to one of our groups in person. We have a number of contributors today and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm David Willis. Um, I'm project manager with the Far Away CIC. Um, I also work in private practice as a counsellor and I'm the parent um, of an autistic young woman and um, also my granddaughter is autistic. My name is Rosemary. I am the research assistant at Faraway Kick, and I was diagnosed as autistic in 2018. My name's Jay. I work for the Faraway Kick as an autism mentor. My name is Sammy, and I'm autistic. My name's Amber. Uh, I'm a peer mentor over at the Adult Autism Service in the Faraway Kick. Uh, I'm also Finding solutions to problems, I suppose, is probably my best title. As you can see, we have all either been through the diagnostic process ourselves or have supported family members through it. And I think it's really useful to have these different perspectives in a video like this. We're looking at neurodiversity and the diagnostic process in the first half of the video. And part two will cover managing your expectations of the diagnostic process and what happens after you're either diagnosed or not diagnosed with autism. Let's get started. What is neurodiversity? Very simply, neurodiverse brains are wired differently to neurotypical brains. Neurodivergent people view the world in a different and unique way to other people. And neurodiversity covers a broad range of conditions. And here are some of those conditions. We've got autism and ADHD, which are most commonly known, alongside things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, Tourette syndrome and bipolar disorder, to name just a few. Neurodiversity is vast and it's useful to think about before we start going into the specifics of autism. Many autistic people prefer to refer to themselves as neurodivergent, but not all neurodivergent people are autistic, as we can see. And this list is by no means exhaustive. Neurodiversity relates to any condition that diverges from the typical or mythical norm. Here is an actual scan of a neurodivergent brain next to a neurotypical brain. As you can see, there is a lot more going on in the neurodivergent brain. I love this image because it highlights the fact that neurodivergence isn't a disease or an illness. It's an actual physical difference in brain structure, quite literally in the way it's wired up. There's nothing wrong with it. Personally, I think it looks a damn sight more interesting than the other brain. Unfortunately, we don't have near enough time to go into specifically why it's so different. But a simple answer would be how it relates to processing particularly sensory processing in this case, because it's a scan of an autistic brain, specifically that of Temple Grandin, who's quite a famous and divisive autistic figure. So what can you expect from the autism diagnostic process? Well, the truth is that everyone's assessment is different. It's up to the discretion of the assessor, who's usually a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist, to decide how much information's needed and what diagnostic tools to use, which are generally different verbal interviews or written surveys. But the overall process looks like this. After you've been referred, you're put on a waiting list. The list can be quite long and there's no actual indication as to how many people are in front of you, which can be quite stressful. Thankfully in North East Lincolnshire, we have a relatively short wait. There are some areas in the UK where the waiting times can be years. Consequently, at an unspecified amount of time, you will receive a letter inviting you to a formal assessment. As we've already said, these assessments have to be in depth and cover a lot of things in order to be accurate. And they can take varying amount of times depending upon both your personal circumstances and the amount of information the assessor needs. After your assessment, you'll be given your results, which will be one of two things. 
either that you're diagnosed with autism. It could also say autistic spectrum disorder or autistic spectrum condition or even Asperger's syndrome, even though technically this term has been dropped from the official diagnostic manuals. Or secondly, that you don't meet the threshold for a clinical diagnosis of autism. After you receive your results, you'll be in the period known as post-diagnosis. And what that looks like for you will depend upon the results of your assessment. And we're gonna cover that in more depth in the second part of the video. Let's see what the National Autistic Society has to say about the diagnostic assessment. You will see a team made up of different healthcare professionals, such as clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, trainee psychologists, um, possibly autism support workers, who will determine whether you meet the criteria for a diagnosis of autism. You'll be asked to complete surveys and answer questions. It's helpful to have someone with you, such as a parent or sibling, who can give information about your childhood. This is a purely verbal and written assessment, and at no point should you be asked to take part in any kind of physical examination. All of the local assessments are currently done either within the Queen Street Centre on Eurospace in Grimsby, or within Young Minds Matter, which I believe are based at Freshney Green Primary Care Centre in Grimsby. Just a quick point that tends to come up in the groups. You don't have to take anyone with you. You might be estranged from your family, for example. It won't stop you from getting a diagnosis. And if you don't have a family member, you might want to take a friend or a partner, basically someone who's known you over a significant amount of time. And this is basically so the assessor can get more information. But again, it's not completely necessary. The diagnostic assessment focuses on social interaction, communication and language, sensory perception, that's hyper or hypo sensitivities, whether you're either over or under sensitive, and restrictive and repetitive behaviours and special interests. These form the basis of the questions you'll be asked, so thinking specifically about what difficulties you have within these areas will help, but you definitely shouldn't worry about it. The questions aren't something you can get wrong because whoever's assessing you wants to know what your experiences are and you've lived them. Literally, no one knows better than you. Just make sure you go into as much detail as you can with examples of when you've done it. And also, if you don't understand anything that's been asked, just say, it's okay to ask for clarification. They have a knack of wording things that can be quite confusing. So what does this actually mean in real terms? You will be asked lots of questions, both verbally and by completing various questionnaires and surveys. It takes time and everyone's assessment can be different. Some people's assessments can be quite straightforward, others can be more complicated. And this depends on how much information is needed and also what your personal circumstances are at the time. So let's go around everyone and find out what the autism diagnostic process was like for them or their family members. My daughter's experience of the diagnostic process, um, it took some time to actually get on the pathway in the first place. Um, and she filled in lots of questionnaires. She had actually filled in some questionnaires previously um, and they were all taken together, but it, it the actual um, interview that I went along to with her took about three to four hours. Um, and uh, the, they asked lots of questions about um, her childhood and how she'd been when she was young. It took a while to get uh, to the point where I got a diagnosis. But once I started having my appointment, it was really quick. My experience with the diagnostic process was I went to a open door and I had to fill in this like massive booklet that just had a lot of questions on. It wasn't very... Because I wasn't talking to someone, it wasn't very, it didn't feel very personal. It felt as though I was just checking off answers and just trying to come up with as much experience that I thought was relevant as possible. 
And then once I filled in that massive booklet, I took it back to Open Door where um, the woman there went through it all. And then she made another appointment where I came back and she was just like, yeah, basically this is your diagnosis. Didn't really explain anything and was just like, this is it. Take it home and read it in your own time. She should have known I was never going to read it. It was difficult to get into the, the process. Um because I, I felt like I had to convince people to put me through referral. Um, I had quite a significant um, a significant experience with the mental health system by the point that I got to thinking that I might be autistic. And so I felt that I was very dismissed by the NHS. Um, so getting to the process um, was possibly the most challenging thing. Um, when, I, when I finally got to the appointment, um, me and my dad went together um, because they wanted to interview my dad about um, my childhood experiences. Um, immediately, on entering the room with this lady who was doing the process, immediately I felt different. Um, I felt that I wasn't being judged in a, um, a mental health context. Um, I felt that I wasn't having... Um, <laughs> I wasn't having labels put on me about various mental illnesses. Um, and it sort of, in a way, it made me relax inside, not on the outside, I was still, uh, <laughs> I was very stressed and doing all the typically autistic uh, flapping and, you know. <laughs> um, so it was, it was quite a, a good experience for me in the actual, um, in the actual interview where she was asking the questions and I felt more like I was being understood because the types of questions that she was asking were very different to um, all the questions that had been asked of me during the mental health issues with uh, psychiatric nurses and doctors and that. Um, and I felt that I was identifying with issues um, saying yes well actually that that issue was for me when I was a child it was a, a thing it did happen but no doctor up until that point would have asked it. Um, the diagnostic process was a fascinating one for me I was lucky enough that two completely random people suggested that I might be autistic I'd never considered it as a thing I didn't know what that meant uh, all I ever knew about what autism was, was from my friend's cousin, who was a non-speaking autistic little boy in an oversized wheelchair sort of thing. So it, it never connected to me that it, it might be my thing too. Um, so when I went to my doctors and I went, look, people have suggested this, I need to learn more. They were at first going, well, why do you think that? And I'm like, well, because, you know, people don't normally point out that sort of stuff. And I've done some reading and it's sort of adding up a bit. And I, I need to know more here. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I first got my appointment, there was a, a big wait. So be prepared for that. The waiting times are, are long. We're lucky around here. We've got some of the best services in the UK. But still, it, it is going to be a fairly lengthy process. And I remember my first meeting, meeting up with the clinical psychologist, their assistant. And we ran through some really weird tests. Um, there was things like little toys and just play with them normally. And I don't know about you, but how often do we play with toys normally unless you've got kids, you know? And there was a, a book, and I remember the book spectacularly because there was frogs in it. And I don't know why, but the frogs made me so sad. And I, I had to stop and apologize because I was literally in tears. And I, I said, I don't know what's going on. This isn't normal for me. And they said, yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Just, just respond how 
is natural. Don't, don't worry about it too much. So yeah, if you're going through your diagnostic, it's going to be a bit of a weird experience, but be yourself. That's the best answer I can give. And I know that's a difficult answer because a lot of us have built layers to fit in and not be seen as weird. But, you know, if you've got some weirdness, then roll with it, because what's it going to do? Make you more autistic, you know? That's the end of part one. Don't forget to check out part two, where we'll look at managing your expectations of the diagnostic process. Thank you for watching.